to St. Barnabas Presbyterian Church for this service of witness to the resurrection and a celebration of the life of Joan Powers Huntley. We're glad that you are here. This is a Presbyterian service, and as such, I want to let you know a little bit about what to expect. You will hear a lot of scripture read and proclaimed today, as it is in the sentences of scripture that we find both our comfort and our hope. There are different places in the bulletin for you to participate, both in prayer and singing, and I encourage you to do so, that, so that this family will know that they are surrounded by our love and support. We begin each service at St. Barnabas, pouring water into the font to remind us of our baptism. For in these waters, we also hear promises. We are loved. We are claimed. We are chosen. Please stand and say the sentences of scripture with me that are printed in the bulletin. When we were baptized into Christ Jesus, we were baptized into his death. We were buried, therefore, with him by baptism into death, so that as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, we too might live a new life. For if we have been united with him in a death like his, we shall certainly be united with him in a resurrection like his. For as many of you who have been baptized into Christ have put on Christ. In her baptism, Joan put on Christ. In the day of Christ's coming, she shall be clothed in glory. little doubt that our relationship with God and God's creation is imperfect. We understand sin to be anything which separates us from the will of God. We sometimes call them shortcomings or brokenness or failings, but no matter what we call them, we recognize that we fall short of God's call to love God and to love one another. And so, before God and before one another, let us pray a prayer of confession together as printed in your bulletin. Holy God, you see us as we are and know our inmost thoughts. We confess that we are unworthy of your gracious care. We forget that all life comes from you and that to you all life We celebrate the truth that there is no power on earth, not even death itself, which can separate us from the love of God. Friends, this is the good news. In Jesus Christ, we are forgiven. Amen. As we turn to hearing the word of God proclaimed in scripture, I will invite you to please pray with me. The hope of resurrection we celebrate today is hope we find spoken to us in Scripture. Holy God, open our minds and hearts by the power of your Holy Spirit, that as your Scriptures are read and your Word is proclaimed, we might hear what it is you say to us this day. Amen. The Psalms speak to every type of human experience especially experiences in faith. 
from the greatest of joys to the deepest sorrows. They provide words of comfort in times of loss. They provide words of hope when we are in need of them. Hear these words from the 103rd Psalm. Bless the Lord, O my soul, and all that is within me. Bless his holy name. Bless the Lord, O my soul, and do not forget all his benefits, who forgives all your iniquity, who heals all your diseases, who redeems your life from the pit, who crowns you with steadfast love and mercy, who satisfies you with good as long as you live, so that your youth is renewed like the eagles. The Lord works vindication and justice for all who are oppressed. He made known his ways to Moses, his acts to the people of Israel. The Lord is merciful and gracious, slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love. The Lord will not always accuse, nor will he keep his anger forever. He does not deal with us according to our sins, nor repay us according to our iniquities. For as the heavens are high above the earth, so great is the Lord's steadfast love towards those who fear him. As far as the east is from the west, so far he removes, removes our transgressions from us. As a father has compassion for his children, so the Lord has compassion towards those who fear him. He knows how we were made. He remembers that we were dust. As for mortals, their days are like grass. They flourish like a flower of the field, for the wind passes over it, and it is gone, and its place remembers it no more. But the steadfast love of the Lord is from everlasting to everlasting on those who fear him. His righteousness to his children's children, to those who keep his covenant and remember to do his commandments. One of the beliefs that I have heard many stories told about Joan was that she was a believer in hope. Hope that in even dark situations light can shine, and that even when goings were tough, that there is always a way to persevere. We find that same sort of in the character and words of Job. Hear these words from the 19th chapter of the book of Job. Oh, that my words were written down. Oh, that they were inscribed in a book. Oh, that with an iron pen and with lead, lead that they were engraved on a rock forever. For I know that my Redeemer lives, and that at the last he will stand upon the earth, and after my skin has been destroyed, then in the flesh I shall see God whom I shall see on my side, and my eyes shall behold, and not another. My heart faints within me. Another one of Jenna's true gifts was not only her wisdom, but the quiet confidence that she exuded that drew people to seek her advice. Scripture tells us a lot about what faithful wisdom looks like we find one example in Exodus chapter 18, which tells us about Jethro, Moses' father-in-law, who was tasked by God to give counsel on God's behalf. Hear these words of scripture now. The next day, Moses sat as judge for the people, while the people stood around him from morning until evening. When Moses' father-in-law saw all that he was doing for the people, he said, What is that that you are doing for the people? Why do you sit alone while all the people stand around you from morning until evening? Moses said to his father-in-law, Because the people come to me to inquire of God. When they have a dispute, they come to me, and I decide between one person and another. And I make known to them the statutes and instructions of God. Jethro said to him, What are you doing? What you are doing 
is not good, you surely will wear yourself out, both you and the people with you. For the task is too heavy for you. You cannot do it alone. Now listen to me, I will give you counsel and God be with you. You should represent the people before God and you should bring their cases before God, teach them the statutes and instructions and make known to them the way that they are to go and the things they are to do. You should also look for able men among all the other people. Men who fear God are trustworthy and hate dishonest gain. Set such men over them as officers over thousands, hundreds, fifties, and tens. Let them sit as judges for the people at all times. Let them bring every important case to you, but decide every minor case for themselves. So it will be easier for you, and they will bear the burden with you. If you do this as God commands you, then you will be able to endure, and all these people will go to their home in peace. So Moses listened to his father-in-law and did all that he had said. Moses chose able men from all Israel and appointed them as heads over the people, as officers over thousands and hundreds and fifties and tens. As they judged the people at all times, hard cases they brought to Moses, the minor cases they decided themselves. Then Moses let his father-in-law depart. He went off to his own country. The grass withers and the flower fades. The word of the Lord shall stand forever. Amen. Our first remembrance this afternoon will be offered by Jones' son-in-law, Matt Bach. My name is Matt Bach, and I'm honored to be giving this eulogy for Joan Huntley, my mother-in-law. 28 years ago, I had the very good fortune to meet and marry Sue Huntley, not knowing then that Joan and Wally would be part of the deal. <laughs> but let me begin first by recognizing some of those that are here. Joan would want that. Uh, any members of Glendale Presbyterian Church, Joan's Delta Kappa Gamma sisters, her YMCA buddies, her caregivers from Marianne Circle and Highland Springs, the members here at St. Barnabas Presbyterian Church, and of course her friends and neighbors from Holiday Park. And a special thanks to her extended family from traveling from all over the country to be here. My apologies, I'm sure I'm missing some people, but please know on behalf of the family how much your presence here today means to us. If Joan were here, well, she'd be greatly embarrassed by all this fuss, but she would tell you how much you meant to her and that you made her life richer. You know, most eulogies require some amount of filtering, not so with Joan. Pick any aspect of her life, and she, in her quiet, unassuming way, was doing exemplary things. Finishing, finishing college while raising a family. Her unwavering love and support of Wally for 64 years. 25 years of teaching and all the many young lives she touched. Volunteering with the Girl Scouts. Joan was a founding member and deacon with Glendale Presbyterian Church and a deacon right here at St. Barnabas. And as as if all that wasn't enough, she also helped two youngish parents who knew nothing about parenting raise their two daughters. I often called Joan Joni. After I got to know Joan, that name seemed to stay too formal. Joni was playful. She was cheerful, inquisitive, adventurous, quick to laugh, and always in good humor. Joan's spirit didn't seem to age. When I was with her, it never occurred to me I'm with an elderly person. Of course, now that I'm over 60, I have a new perspective on what elderly is. <laughs> you know, I and so many of you could stand up and talk about Joan's wonderful attributes. Smart, determined, patient, kind, always willing to help. I mean, the list goes on. So I won't preach to the choir. Sadly, there's not a choir here. That would be a great line. But one attribute that stands out was Joan's ability to transcend the superficial differences in people, the differences that so often divide us, political, 
ethnic, sexual orientation, whatever it is, she had a gift for looking beyond those differences and connecting with the essence of a person. I didn't know Joan's father, John Julius Powers, but by all accounts, he was a wonderful man, a very devoted, loving father. Joan would tell me stories of the pharmacy he owned and operated, how he always made time for her to do fun things, such as weekend car rides. And at a time when some questioned the value of providing a higher education to a woman, Joan's father saw her potential and was determined that she should get her college education. Joan attended St. Lawrence University where she met Wally. She didn't complete her college at St. Lawrence. In 1951, she and Wally were married and moved to Dallas to start her life together. But true to form, she went back to college later in life, graduating from the University of North Texas. Now having your in-laws live in the same neighborhood, much less moving in right behind you, might be fraught with issues and drama. But with Joan and Wally, it was wonderful. Sue and I are so thankful that they are a major part of our daughter's lives. Here I'm quoting Lizzie. It was amazing how Grandma looked for the good in all of us and brought out the best in all of us. And this is from Laura's 52 Reasons Why You Were an Exceptional Grandmother. This was a wonderful Christmas gift. Laura, with a booklet and a deck of cards, pasted a card on each page and wrote in this case, why grandma was exceptional, each of the 52 pages. I'll read just two. Because you would watch me after school and help me with my homework. Because you loved to read in a tub and you inspired me to read tales of the South Pacific. Lizzie goes on, I wouldn't be the writer I am today. I wouldn't be as caring or sweet a person. I think grandma really imparted those qualities on me. And I see those in mom all the time as do I. Lizzie continues. I was a little sixth grader, after, and after school, I just wanted to be home alone. But Grandma would say, just come over and get a sandwich, and then you can go right back. So I would do that. But often I would stay over longer, and she would talk to me and teach me things. She always made me great sandwiches, and then she and Abu, Abu is the name they gave to Wally, because they couldn't say Wally, it's young kids would drive me to football practice, and Abu would sometimes stay and watch me, and that was really sweet. And they would come to my soccer and basketball games. I remember after the game, even if things didn't go well, how unyieldingly positive Grandma was. It just came down to how much she really believed in me. Growing up as a young girl, Sue's relationship with Joan seems to have been quite normal, with the typical ups and downs mothers and daughters have. Sue tells a story of her as a teenager, calling out to Joan, complaining that Joan, who was doing the dishes in the kitchen, was making so much noise, Sue couldn't hear the TV. <laughs> as I say, it was a normal relationship. When Sue and I got married, and especially after we had Laura and Lizzie, Joan and Wally became a much bigger part of our lives, and thankfully so. When Joan and Wally moved in right behind us, they joined our group of neighbors and friends and we became even closer. But after Wally passed away, that's when Joan and Sue became inseparable. It was a special time for Joan, Sue, and me. I stood at this spot five years ago, honored at that time to giving a eulogy for Wally. In that eulogy, I spoke with both Joan and Wally because they'd shared 64 years together. Friends and family alike saw them as one. It was unclear at the time how Joan would cope without Wally. 64 years is a long time. Well, Joan was made of stern stuff. I know adjusting to life without Wally was hard, but ultimately, Joan blossomed. I think it was the only time in her adult life when she wasn't responsible for or caring for someone else. She traveled, she was active in the community as well as here at St. Barnabas. She had her Tai Chi and yoga classes. She loved gardening. And fortunately, she spent a lot of time with us. We had our evening routine. As soon as Sue and I got home from work, we called Joni to go off for a walk around our park. We'd all meet and start our walk. Sue gently chiding Joan for not standing up straight, and I shushing Sue for chiding Joan. And so it would go, and fits and starts, we'd slowly make our way around the park. 
Joan telling us about her yoga class and what she accomplished in her garden, or how much progress she'd made organizing her stuff. Joan was a bit of a pack rat. <laughs> if we were lucky, at the end of the walk, Joni would invite us over for dinner. Dinner Jones was the best. On a cool fall evening, coming into her warm kitchen, smelling the food cooking, Joni busy at the stove while Sue and I got the table ready. You just knew you were going to have a wonderful meal with great conversation and, and just surrounded by love. Those times were as nice as anything I've ever known. It just seemed like our lives were in the house. With no warning, this special time in all our lives came to a crashing end, Mother's Day 2018, with Joan having a stroke. As many of you know, the stroke made it impossible for Joan to live independently. She couldn't speak very well and lost much of the use of her right hand and arm. I think if Joan had had her way, she would have preferred to have passed away right then and there, but life is rarely that neat. I'm grasping at straws here, but if there was a silver lining at all to this phase of Joan's life, it was the fierce devotion displayed by Sue and Scott. Scott made many trips to Dallas to help out and be with his mother. Sue was consumed with Joan's well-being on a daily basis. She never complained, but rather focused on what she could do for Joan to make her life better. Sue monitored Joan's recovery, her medical care, her physical therapy, as well as decorating Joan's room, spending most evenings watching Jeopardy with Joan, taking her out to movies, and bringing her home to have dinner with us. All this and more, Sue and Scott approached not as an unwelcome hardship, but out of love and devotion for Joan. And Joan, ever being Joan, was positive and cheery. But after a year and a half, having endured many physical therapy sessions, doctor's visits, trips to the emergency room, hospital stays, Joan was simply tired of it all. This was not the life she wanted. Indeed, existing in this condition was something Joan specifically did not want, having seen Wally go through this. It was a blessing that Joan passed away last month and didn't leave her any longer. Grandma saw the good in people, saw their true hearts. Well, Joni, our lives are richer because of you and we love you. Thank you. My daughter Miranda was just a young teenager. She asked me, Dad, is Grandma really perfect or is this just some kind of act? <laughs> <laughs> she came to know what we all came to know, that it was no act. So today we gathered to observe the passing of my mother. Joan Eleanor Powers Huntley. These occasions are often mournful, but I have to say both Sue and I feel like Lou Gehrig did when he gave his farewell speech in Yankee Stadium in 1939. We are the luckiest kids on the face of the earth because our mother was perfect. Like many folk, parents of folks my age, she was a depression kid growing up in an Irish, essentially immigrant home in New York, Rochester, New York. Like many daughters, she loved her mother, adored her father, and worshipped her big brother, my Uncle Hank, who would help her so much later in life. She met my dad, Wally, who would never let anybody call him by his real given names, uh, at college and fell head over heels in love with him. She left home and family to start a new life in Texas at the age of 20, an age when most not even old enough to drink in those days. It wasn't easy. Dad's business struggled and eventually faltered, so money stresses were common, as they often are in early marriages. My sister, Sally Ann, died at SIDS when she was just three weeks old and Mom was just 23. These are the kind of stresses that can ruin most marriages, but with the help of her brother, my Uncle Hank, and good support from my grandmother, her mother-in-law, Emily, she and Dad worked through the grief and committed to build a stronger marriage. Part of that commitment was a stronger attention to faith. Tom Curry, then the minister of the Oak Cliff Presbyterian Church, was there for them in their grief, so they were there at church for him. And the messages they heard made them stronger. For some, faith is convenient or social, and promises of thoughts and prayers are just empty promises. For my mom, it was real. 
She believed what the psalmist proclaimed, that the Lord was her strength and her shield. She trusted in him, and she was comforted. Why do I believe her faith was real? Not because she told me it was or talked about it all the time. Her bookshelves were covered with Bibles and books of prayer and inspiration. And I also saw it in her behavior and how she treated others. Once, only a few years ago, when my dad was sick, I was busy and was walking down the hall and I thought she was asleep. But her light was on and the door was slightly ajar. And I glanced in and she was sitting on the edge of the bed with a book at her side and her hands folded and her head bowed in prayer. Not for show because she didn't know anybody was looking, but because she believed. I believe she was praying for others, not herself. She had had a life experience and knew that God puts in our path things that we think are challenges, but that he knows will either strengthen our faith or cause us to re-examine why it is we want this relationship in the first place. For example, when her brother, my Uncle Hank, died unexpectedly at just 44, she was devastated. At the same time, first Sue and then I became teenagers, and we did the things that many teenagers do to make their parents' lives living in hell. I need to pause for a public apology. Mom, I'm heartily sorry for all of the grief I caused you as, as a teenager. And if it's any comfort at all, you didn't know about half of it. <laughs> With those challenges, she became focused on doing positive things. She went back to college, got her teaching degree so that she could teach kindergarten in a part of town where she thought she could make a difference and by getting to those kids when they were young. And she did. She and my father became active in Glendale Presbyterian, helping that church with it promote its faith and social missions. She also coped apart from my uncle's death by becoming more devoted to his kids, Mike and Jack and Doug and Barb. And she became a backup mother for them as my Aunt Pat so ably dealt with assuming widowhood and fatherhood in addition to being a mother at which she excelled. And when they became adults, she adopted their spouses, Sandy, Lori, and Deb, and Tim, as her own. And then she became an additional grandparent to all of their kids, ten and all, remembering them on their birthdays and Christmas and other times. And she was there for my other cousins as well, Jim and his wife Sharon, and Nancy, and my cousin, other cousin Jack. She was there for them, even though she wasn't their blood aunt. And they took advantage of her availability. When my dad was sick for so long, and until the very end, she was his sole caregiver. She forewent, if, if that's a word, most of her social life and free time to care for him in ways that were superhuman. She literally broke his leg and then walked it off rather than submit to surgery and be incapacitated for six weeks while it repaired and unable to then care for him. The leg healed about an inch shorter than the other one, so if you noticed at the end of her life, she waddled. I say mostly alone, and that could be mistaken because Sue was there and she would come over all the time and help as well. And Sue would be there as mom's sole caregiver when it was her turn to be incapacitated. My mom touched many people. When my dad passed, she became a deacon. She had the yoga group, she had a lunch group, she had Delta, Delta Kappa Gamma. Everywhere she went, she touched people with her faith. She was, I think, the great mother in C.S. Lewis's book, The Great Divorce. In that book, which is only 100 pages long, the residents of hell are there because they chose to be there, not because they were sent there for bad deeds, they would rather live in hell than accept God's grace and be in his presence. They wanted to earn their place rather than accept God's gift, or they thought that they deserved it for all their talents and merits. And they were unwilling to just accept what God was offering. Again, in this book, the residents of hell are given a chance to visit heaven and see if that experience would change their minds and they were even given the opportunity to stay. Now, I know this is strange theology to some, but this is, it was a literary tool and not necessarily to be taken literally. While there, they came across a great parade. The spirits in heaven danced in procession, welcoming one of the faithful as she entered into the kingdom. They spread flowers before her path. 
And, the honored, and as the honored woman walked into and through paradise, they danced and they sang songs that Lewis describes, if one wrote down the notes and the words of those songs, no man would ever grow old reading that score. The visitor from hell who saw this parade assumed she must be God. But the heavenly guy told him that he was mistaken. Fame in this country and on earth are two completely different things, he said. She's someone you'll never have heard of. But here, she's one of the great ones. And those walking with her are her sons and her daughters. Every man she met became her son, every woman her daughter. But that motherhood was of a different kind. Those on whom it fell went back to their natural parents, or their wives, or their husbands, loving them all the more. And now, the abundance of life she has in Christ from the Father flows over into them. It's like when you drop a stone in a pool and the waves spread out concentrically. Who knows where they'll end? Her redeemed humanity is still young, but there is joy enough in the little finger of a saint such as yonder lady to waken all of the dead things in life. That was my mom. That's how she lived. And that's how she touched people. And that's why Sue and I and all of us are among the luckiest people on the face of the earth. And now, I believe that she is being welcomed into the bosom of God, and I believe that there is already enough joy in her little finger to awaken all of the dead things in the universe to life. Thank you. Matter, they weren't important indicators of personhood for her. She wanted to know the depth that was at a person's core. And she wanted others to know the depth that was at her own core. And she did that by being very real, by being very vulnerable, and by seeking to enjoy something about whatever life was offering her at the moment. Joan knew who she was. She knew what she valued. And she knew that the hard times in life would be much more manageable when she looked for the joy in them. I think that's the devoted Presbyterian in her. Her knowledge that the chief end of humankind, according to question one of the Westminster Catechism, shorter catechism, is to glorify God and enjoy God forever. Joan took that call seriously. Whether she was having a meal with a friend, or visiting a homebound member of the church, or playing kickball in the street, or pouring a couple of glasses of wine to enjoy with Sue after work. Joan was one of those people who just seemed to innately know the exact right thing to say and to do. And as you've heard from Matt and from Scott, she was often other people's touchstone, the rock in the family, the steady in the storm. And many times it seemed to others as if she never wavered, as if she never doubted. But I'm sure there were times in her life when she did. She was human after all. And Joan didn't live a charmed life. There was plenty of heartache and heartbreak to go around. When she was a young woman, she and Wally lost their daughter Sally Ann to SIDS, which led to a time of, of deep sadness and questioning. And as a middle-aged woman, she grieved the loss of her brother and best friend. And as an older woman, she said a long goodbye to the man that she loved. And most recently, Joan suffered a severe stroke that claimed most of her voice and most of her mobility. But Joan weathered even these tearful times with grace and with purpose, unafraid to lean into God with courage and fierce tenacity. During one particularly difficult time when Wally was not well, Scott told you that he visited his mom and dad and got up in the middle of the night and saw the light on and figured 
that he might go and console her, only to discover that she consoled him in a way that he never expected. Joan was indeed awake, but she was praying, leaning on and leaning into her relationship with Christ. And Scott witnessed her finding this moment of deep peace at a time of great angst. She never knew that he saw her there or the impact that that made upon him, just being able to witness it. Now, many people pray, but it is few that allow Christ to give them the strength to keep living, keep loving, and keep enjoying every minute of every day that she was given. People sought Joan out because she could comfort them, and you could count on her to listen to you and tell you not only what you needed to hear, not only what you wanted to hear, but what you needed to hear. She could tell you the truth. That's what made her such a great deacon. She served people well. But at the end of her life, Joan had to rely on other people to serve her. Joan's daughter, Sue, said that one of the hardest things about her mother having a stroke was that she could no longer easily share those words of wisdom that Sue longed to hear from her. And even though most of her words were lost, Joan continued to embody that wisdom, imparting it up to us in ways that were beyond her knowing. Her family watched as she suffered sadness and loss and even some depression. But once again, finding her way back to joy that was so much a part of who she was. And because we have known her, it is a part of who we are too. Joan's wisdom is planted deep within our bones. Dinna, fash yourself. I have said these things to you so that my joy may be in you and your joy may be complete. Today, as we celebrate the life of a good and faithful servant, a deacon extraordinaire. May we find peace and comfort and joy in knowing that Joan Huntley is not called servant any longer, but she is called a friend. For indeed, she has made known to us everything she has learned from God. May we go and bear much fruit for the seeds have indeed been planted. Amen. Joan's family made an odd but very appropriate request that we sing together the doxology as a response, giving thanks and praise to God for the good gifts that we have been given. Joan's granddaughter, Laura Bach, will be accompanying us as we sing. So I will ask you to please find hymn number 606. And Laura will play it through once, and then when she starts the second time, please join in singing. Let us stand now.
generations rise and pass away. We praise you for all your servants, who having lived this life in faith, now live eternally with you. Especially we thank you for your servant, Joan, whose baptism is now complete in death. You have claimed Joan as your very own, and in your grace she now dwells beside you. We praise you for the gift of her life and for all in her that was good and kind and faithful. Today we hold fast to the truth that for Joan, suffering is no more, that death is past and pain is ended. And while we surely mourn that she is no longer among us, we know that in eternity and in the family and friends who love her, she lives on. We give thanks for all the ways she gifted us with her presence, for the way she fostered community wherever she went, for her curiosity and her brilliant intellect, for her dedicated service to your church, for her joy, for her love. Lord, for a life so very, very well lived, we give you thanks. This we know. Joan has now entered the joy you have prepared through Jesus Christ our Lord. All glory and honor are yours, holy God now and forever. Amen. Holy God, we commend Joan Eleanor Powers Huntley into your merciful care. Ashes to ashes, dust to dust, may Joan be a part of the world's cycle of dying and of life. May she go forward in our love into the presence of love's completeness, now and forever. Amen. As we leave this place, may the memories that we have shared bring strength to our hearts. And may the love that has been shared give us joy, that we may take that out into the world to be a blessing for all. And knowing what Joan knows, that the love of God surrounds us, the grace of God can astound us, and the hope of God will always ground us. Amen.